Welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. It's an honor to have you join us in worship service today. We invite you to visit us virtually at any time. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to love and support one another in our Christian growth. We are not here to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We teach, preach, and live God's Word and God's Word alone.
Truly, God is worthy of our worship and our praise. We are so thankful to have been able to start our time with you with this song, Worship and Praise. Welcome from His Gospel Christian Fellowship. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Good morning, good evening. We are delighted to be here with you. We are going to start this next section of our time together with the scripture. It's the scripture that I read every time I stand to preach for you. And it comes from Psalms 100. I'm reading to you out of the King James Version. And the word of God says thus, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I'm going to read that last verse one more time. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and his hearing and the doing of his word. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you for this opportunity to gather together virtually, Lord, to sing songs of praise, to hear your word, to pray. We thank you, Lord, because we know that it is by your mercy and by your grace that we have had one more opportunity to come together. Lord, I ask that as I stand before your people on this day, that you open up hearts and that you open up minds. Father, that you decrease glory and that your words come forth according to your will and to your way. As I say every time I preach, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight because, Lord, you are truly my strength and my redeemer. Lord, I thank you, I praise you, I magnify and glorify you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. All right, my brothers and sisters, we are now going to start the sermon. And the title of the sermon is Connecting Others to Jesus. I'm going to read one and a half scriptures to you today. I'm not even reading two whole scriptures, just one and a half. And we're going to be coming from the book of John the Gospel of John, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and that fourth Gospel is John. And if you would meet me in the first chapter of John, the fourth, excuse me, first chapter in the 41st verse, the Word of God states, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ and he brought him to Jesus. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this very, very short amount of scripture that I've read to you. In the scripture, I'm talking about the apostle Andrew, the disciple Andrew. And Andrew is one of the last lesser known disciples. I mean, we've heard his name, but we haven't heard a lot about him. Uh, we just know that he was one of the disciples. There's nothing in scripture that talks about him doing anything extraordinary. He didn't write any books of the New Testament. We don't have any record of him proclaiming the gospel between or before kings or noble people. We, we don't have any record of him preaching before large crowds. There's no record of him parting the Red Sea or raising people from the dead or healing the sick. We don't read any of that about Andrew in scripture. As a matter of fact, Andrew is only mentioned four distinct times in the New Testament. But each of the times that Andrew is mentioned, he's doing one thing. He's doing the thing that all of us as Christians should be doing. 
And that thing that he is doing is he is connecting others to Christ. Now, in the scripture that we read, Andrew was with John the Baptist when John the Baptist said, Behold, there's the Lamb of God. And Andrew, wanting to know more about that Lamb of God, wanting to know more about who Jesus was, and keep in mind, this is at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He left John the Baptist to go find out more about Jesus. Spent a whole, a whole afternoon with Jesus, and he started to understand that Jesus truly was the Messiah, was truly the one that the scriptures of old had talked about, was truly the one that they had been waiting for. And rather than just marvel with that information, just to keep it to himself, to be happy, to be satisfied, to be amazed, he went out to spread that information. And the first person he went to was his brother, Simon, whom we also know, know as Peter. So he went, and that's the part that we read. He went and he found his brother, and he said to his brother, we have found the Messiah. He was connecting his brother Peter to Jesus. Now, we do know a lot about Peter. Peter, it was him and not Andrew who was a part of Jesus's inner circle. It was Peter who Jesus called to walk on water to come out to meet him. It was Peter, not Andrew, who Jesus said, feed my sheep. It was Peter, not Andrew, who Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church. It was Peter, not Andrew, that we look at as one of the main foundations of the Christian faith today. However, the reason why we're talking about Andrew today is that, there, that all of what I just talked about would not have occurred had Andrew not connected his brother Peter to Christ. All of what we are going to be talking about in looking at some of the things that Peter accomplished in later sermons would not have happened had there not been that connection, had there not been that putting together introduction, if you will, of Peter to come to know who Christ was. When we look at John 6, the 8th and ninth verses, in that chapter, we find that it was Andrew who found the little boy that had the two fish and five loaves of bread, and he connected that little boy to Jesus. And we know many of us of the story of what happened after that, how Jesus took the two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. So the thing that we need to understand is that we are called at the very foundation of our own walks with the Lord to connect people to Jesus. There are four points that I want to talk about when it comes to connecting people to Jesus that we want to focus on and we want to take a look at. The first is that you have to have a relationship with someone that you're introducing. For example, if you knew two people that seem to be just perfect for, the, for each other and you want to introduce them, you have to have some kind of relationship with both of them on some level. You wouldn't just take um, go up to a person you don't know that you have no relationship with and say, hey, you know, I think this guy would be great for you. I want you to meet him. No, for that to be successful, for this connection to be successful, for this introduction to be successful, you have to have a relationship with those that you are introducing. So in this case, even though Andrew had not known Jesus very long, like I said earlier, he had just met him and spent the afternoon talking to him and getting to know what he was preaching and teaching and saying, 
But that was enough for him to have enough of a relationship that he felt comfortable going back to his brother Peter and saying, we found them. This is the one that scripture has talked about and has promised. When I talk about introducing people to Jesus, the first thing that you have to have is a relationship with them. You have to know who Jesus is. You have to have experienced Jesus in your life or this introduction would be hollow at best and probably very ineffective. I can say that when I talk to people about Jesus, I speak from personal experience. When I talk to people about Jesus, it's not just what my mom told me or what my dad told me or what my auntie told me or what some of the old, older saints in my life when I was younger told me. I got to a place in my life where I experienced much of what they told me for myself. I understood what the forgiveness of Jesus felt like. I understood what the mercy of Jesus felt like when I had done something that was horrible, but I confessed and I told God, I did this, I admit it, I own it. And to have that overwhelming peace come upon my life, come upon my heart, to know that I am not going to be damned forever for something that I should be damned forever for. I can speak to that from personal experience. So when I am now making a connection, I can do so because I have a relationship with the person, if you will, that I'm trying to connect you to. The second thing is you have to allow God to prompt you. There are some times that you are in a space where it is appropriate, this is the time to introduce that person to Jesus. And then there are other times when it is not the appropriate environment to make that introduction. Again, bringing it back to the natural world, if you know someone who has just lost a spouse, they just had to go through the tragedy and the angst of burying someone that they love, a week later may not be the time to introduce them to a new potential person, uh, a love interest. God will let you know when it's time. Yes, we want to tell everybody about Jesus when we know what that love feels like, but there are times and there are situations where it is not the time where the person would be most receptive. And if that's the situation that you're facing, you want to just break out and, 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 and tell this person everything that you want to tell them. But the Lord tells you, no, not right now, not at this moment. They're not going to be receptive. Then leave it alone. If you do something that the Lord is not prompting you to do, you can actually have the opposite effect. You can actually drive that person away from Jesus. So allow the Lord to prompt you, allow the Lord to show you and tell you and lead you when it is an appropriate time to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's not to say that all the time is not the good, but a time because all time at every moment in our existence, we should be sharing the gospel by what we do. Sometimes what we say may be occurring at the right or wrong time. But someone should be able to look at your life and see how Jesus can change you, can help you, can support you, can save you, can be that foundation for you. They should be able to see that in your life, even if you don't say a word. So when we're talking about allow the Lord to prompt you when to verbalize, that is what I'm referring to more so than allow the Lord to prompt you by how you live. That should be a constant. The third thing I want to talk about is that we want to get to a place where we trust God for the results. Too often when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about the Lord, when we talk about what he's done for us, when we talk about his goodness, when we invite people to come to know Jesus the same way we do, too often, we do it in such a way that we are trying to be judgmental. We're trying to tell people, you have to do this this way right now. We need to just 
share the good news of Jesus Christ, both in our words when we are prompted to do so and in our deeds at all time, and then allow the Lord to take that introduction and to do what he chooses to do with it. After Andrew introduced his brother, Peter, to Jesus, there is no record in scripture that Andrew hung out and told Peter, hey, this is what you really need to be saying to him. This is how you need to be interacting with him. This is how you need to act when you are around him. He made the connection and then he stepped back and he let that relationship develop between Jesus and Peter to the place that it developed and what we read about in the uh, Gospels in terms of Jesus and his interactions with Peter. Andrew did not try to control that. Andrew did not try to be dominant over that. And he also did not get jealous when it appeared that Peter's relationship and prominence in, in the in the inner circle of Jesus was greater than his own. He did what he was called to do, which was introduce his brother, and then he stepped back. We should do the same thing when we are introducing people to Jesus. It's really not our place to say, okay, well, I'm introducing you to Jesus and you not you need to stop doing this and you need to stop going there and you need to dump this person and you need to stop this habit. Because if you introduce that person to Jesus and Jesus connects with that person in the same way that Jesus connected with you, then all of the things that you think that that person should or should not do, it will work itself out in due time. It is not our place to, to, to tell people, oh, well, you really don't know Jesus because you still do this, or you really don't know Jesus because you still do that. Just make the introduction. Now, if the Lord calls you to come in and walk alongside that person, and at times they need to be uh, corrected or they need to be educated or they need to be supported in some way, that's different. But when we're talking about introducing a person to Jesus, we need to do so in a way where we let God work through that. That's not our place. We don't have to argue with people and try to convince them. Just make the introduction. In John 1, when we look at 45 and 46, those two verses, we see uh, another disciple that we don't hear a whole lot about, but had a monumental impact in the kingdom of God, and that's Philip. Philip has gone very similarly to Andrew. He has he has talked to Jesus. He is now convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the son of God. He is the one that they have been waiting for. And he goes and he tells Nathaniel, who became a, a, a disciple as well. But Nathaniel's first response is, wait a minute, you said this guy is out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Kind of a little bit of an insult. I, I can't believe is. What, what Nathaniel is saying that, that, that God was send the Messiah through coming out of a place like Nazareth. I mean, come on. Rather than argue, rather than get upset, rather than get insulted that what he had just said to Nathaniel was being questioned in some way, all Philip said was, come and see. That's the attitude we need to have when we're introducing people, when we're talking to people, when we are evangelizing, if you will, when we are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. When people start to argue, when people start to say, oh, well, you're crazy to believe that stuff, when they start to cast doubt on what you're saying, rather than get into a long debate, and rather than, and then get into a whole big uh, uh situation where you're talking about scripture and you're trying to, you know, match point by point. And when the person is giving you some um, attitude or some doubt with what you're saying, we should just be like Philip and say, come and see. Just invite them to come and experience Jesus and let them come to their conclusion. Because again, when that, when that connection is made, then you don't have to worry about it because Jesus will take it from there. Jesus will 
let that person know what he wants them to know. If he, they need to be debated, Jesus will debate them. If they need to be corrected, Jesus will correct them. We need to get out of that role of being judgmental and get out of that role of being controlling and let people just come to know Jesus for themselves. The fourth thing and the last thing that I want to mention is that whatever we do, we should not be in a position of repelling people from Jesus. And again, with all of what I was talking about or what I have talked about earlier, this is something we should always keep in mind. Just like we have the ability of making a connection between Jesus and someone else, we have the ability to break that connection. We have the ability to do that by how we say what we say. We have the ability of doing that by how we do what we do. When we are mean, when we are judgmental, when we are uh, vicious, and unfortunately, many people that call themselves Christian are exactly that. You spend more time repelling people, even if you say, I'm trying to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But when you are talking to somebody that maybe don't know a whole lot, a whole lot about Jesus or his teachings, and they look at how you act, they look at how you treat people, they look at the types of things you say and some of the things you do, what you have just done effectively is push them away from Jesus. You have disconnected them from ever coming to a place of knowing Jesus as he really is. Because some people who may not have grown up in that kind of an environment, but they're looking at you and how evil, mean, nasty you are, they're saying, I don't want anything to do with that. And I'll be really honest, I can understand that. You may be the only Jesus that somebody will see in their lifetime or in a certain period of their lifetime. And if that Jesus is coming across as nasty, mean, judgmental, vicious, hateful, they don't want that. They don't want that. That is the opposite of what we have been called to do. So whatever you do, don't disconnect someone. Don't repel someone. Check yourself first before you come out and decide that you're going to share the good news of Jesus Christ, ask yourself the question, am I as connected as I need to be? Because if I go out here with the wrong attitude, with the wrong words, with the wrong demeanor, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I have been called to do as a Christian. I, I would like to ask the question, if, if you had an opportunity to save someone's life. You're, you're going down the street and, and you see an accident or you see somebody fall down and hit their head and they look like they're unconscious or they look like they're not breathing. What would you do? Would you just walk around them? Would you be like in, this, in the story of the Good Samaritan, like the priest and the Levi and cross over to the other side of the road? and keep going? Or would you stop and render whatever aid you could? Would you would you stop with your cell phone and, and call 911? If you know how to do CPR, would you do CPR on the person? If you knew how to help stop the bleeding, if they were bleeding, would you do it? Or would you just walk to the other side of the road? You have the ability, you have the opportunity to possibly save a life. Would you step out of your comfort zone and do that, or would you just keep going? And the reason why I ask that question is that sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, is the same as stopping and helping someone along the way. Because you never know what people are going through. You never know when someone is in a life crisis. You never know when someone needs to hear some encouragement, needs to know that there is, there is hope no matter what situation you're in. There is hope, and that hope can be found in Jesus. You can save a life and not even know it. You can give, it may not even be that you're saying, I, you need to come to Jesus right now. You can just give a word of encouragement to start opening that door. And that might be the word of encouragement that keeps somebody from taking their own life, that keeps someone from doing something uh, that would ruin their life, from taking a drug or getting behind the wheel of a car drunk. 
you never know how you may be impacting or even saving a life by showing the love of Jesus, speaking of, about the love of Jesus to someone who may need to hear it and you may not even know how much they need to hear it. But unfortunately, so many of us Christians are like that Levite or like that priest who crossed to the other side of the road. Yes, I, I'm a Christian. Yes, I, I know about the good news of Jesus Christ, but I don't want to be bothered with those other people. I don't want to be bothered with somebody that looks like they may be a little different from me. I don't want to be bothered from somebody that may not smell as good as I want them to smell. I mean, I don't want to be bothered with, with somebody that's different. So I'm going to just cross over to the other side of the road. I'm, I'm not going to take the opportunity to, to just even give them a smile on this day to, to let them know through me that God does love you. Is that what you want? Is that why God gave himself for you so that you can keep it to yourself? And again, evangelizing may or may not be verbalizing at that moment in time that Jesus came and he died for our sins and he rose on the third day and he went into heaven, but he's coming back. Again, it just means that evangelizing that day might be a smile or a pat on the back or some type of encouragement. That is what God has called us to do. Are you doing that? Are you saving lives? Are you encouraging others? Or are you keeping it all to yourself? waiting for that glorious day when you get your reward in heaven. And if somebody else gets a reward, great, but I'm not going to be bothered with what they may need or what they may uh, require to help get them to that place. So in conclusion, I want to say that we all have different gifts. God has given us all gifts. How we share the love of Jesus happens in different ways according to those gifts. Some people talk more than others. Some people may have artistic gifts in which they can share that information in a musical way or in some type of graphic way. Many people do many different things, but my question to you is how are you using your gift to connect others to Christ? How are you using your gifts to further the kingdom of God on this earth? How are you using your gifts to share the love of Jesus to everyone who is in your vicinity, whether you do it directly or indirectly or both. In all that we do, we should be looking for those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ to someone else. In all that we do, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we may be saving a life when we do that. In all that we do, we want to make sure that God is glorified that whatever we're doing for God and sharing the good news and bringing encouragement to others is not for our own edification, it's not for our own fame, it's not for our own glory, but it's for the glory of God. If you do this, you may be making impacts in this world right now in your time period and in time periods to come that you cannot even begin to imagine. I'm sure that Peter did not know what God's, what Jesus saying to him in terms of feed my sheep, in terms of upon this, this truth, this rock, I build my church. Uh, the work that Peter did before he was killed, he had no idea how it was going to impact not just years, but hundreds, thousands of years later. And it all goes all the way back to Andrew making that first connection. Andrew had no idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be spread from one end of the world to the other because he brought his brother to Christ and his brother did the work that he did. So you never know how God's going to use your one act, but do that one act, do it for the glory of God and know that in due time, God will reward you for that. I do want to say that if you do not have the relationship that I'm talking about where you can introduce somebody to Christ because you don't know him for yourself, well then consider what I've just been saying the last however many minutes 
as my introduction to you to come to get to know Christ. This is my way of connecting you with Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, I speak from not what my mama told me, not what my daddy told me, but what I know from personal experience. I know what the love of Jesus can do. I know how his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness can change you. I know how he can come into your life and some of the things that you thought you absolutely had to have to survive, you don't need that. I invite you right now to come to know this Jesus that I'm talking about. And what you need to do is not what a lot of people would have you do. A lot of people go into the religious piece of you have to do this and that and do this and four weeks later or six weeks later, or you, you can get the right hand of fellowship or if you go to this class, you can become a Christian or if you um, go into this box and, and confess things, then you can think about becoming a Christian. But really, there's only two things that Romans 10, 9, and 10 tell us that we have to do. The first is that we have to believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Son of God, that he came down in the form of a man, that he lived on this earth for 33 years, that he taught us and he modeled for us how we are to live, that he was crucified, he died, he took the punishment that we should have done for all of the sins that we have committed, all of the bad things that we have done. And then after that, he arose from the dead. He arose with all power in his hand. He didn't just slink off into the midnight. No one carried his body off. He got up out of the grave. He walked amongst people and he ate amongst them and he communed with them for 40 days. And then he went into heaven and he went with a promise that he would come back. And if you believe that and you believe that promise and you believe he's coming back one day, and then you are not ashamed to say, yes, I believe that stuff. Yes, I believe that Jesus person. Yes, I believe that he is coming back one day. If you do, then those are the two requirements. You don't have to do any of the other things. I'm not knocking religious tradition. That's fine. However, that is not necessary to have the relationship that I'm talking about with Jesus. And I'm not talking about following religion. I'm talking about following Jesus. If you believe, even if you don't understand it all right now, but if you believe that there is a Jesus, that he did the things that I said that he did, I, or better yet, he did the things that God's word said, then you are a Christian. And once you become a Christian, the next thing that you do is you unite yourself with other Christians because walking the Christian walk in this life is not meant to be done by yourself. So I invite you, if you have made that commitment, and let's just pray a, a quick prayer if you have. And then after that, I'm going to invite you to join with us and we would be more than happy to be that Christian family, that church family that walks alongside you as you start your walk with Jesus. Let's go to the Lord very briefly in prayer where we say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I come to you right now I come to you in thanksgiving for giving me an opportunity to become a part of your family. I come right now saying that I am aware and I am confessing and I am stating that yes, I know that I have sinned. I know I have done things that are against your will and your way. Father, I don't need to necessarily go through all the commandments to try to figure out which ones I did or which ones I didn't because you have placed in my spirit the knowledge of when I am doing right and when I am doing wrong. And I know, I can feel it. I know when I did it that there were things that I did wrong and I tried to hide it and I tried to pretend it didn't happen. But right now, Lord, I'm just saying, yes, I did it. I did those things. I'm confessing that to you. And I'm asking that you forgive me for those things. And I'm asking, Lord, that you move those things away from me so that I am not held accountable for them, that I do not have to stand and answer for them. I'm asking you, Lord, to just wipe my slate clean and allow me to start anew in you. And all that I am and all that I ever will be, I am committing to you right now in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer with me, and if you were sincere when you did, again, welcome to the family. Joining with His Gospel Christian Fellowship is very simple. All you have to do is contact us 
either through our um, email address, which is on your screen, or through our phone by calling us or texting us. And one of us on the ministerial staff will connect with you and we would be more than happy to walk with you and to uh, help you as you would help us as we all are walking this Christian journey. So now we are coming to the end of our time together. And what we normally do is a benediction, which is a reading of scripture and a prayer so that we can part virtually, but we will not part in our spirits and we definitely will not part from Jesus, from the Lord, as we part our time together today. I'm going to read to you from Jude 1. I'm going to read the 24th and the 21st verses, and I'm reading those to you out of the King James Version. King, King James Version. And the Word of God states, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you until we come together again. May you be blessed abundantly according to his riches and into, in his glory. We thank you for joining with us. And we are looking forward to uniting with you again virtually next week. But before you click off, just please stay, stay there for just a moment and listen to the few announcements that we have for you. God loves you. We love you. Be blessed. If you're looking for a church home, look no further. You can become a member of HGCF no matter where you live in the world. We would love to have you become a part of our family. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like to join with us, just send an email to hisgospel at hisgospel.org. Again, that's hisgospel at hisgospel.org. We'd love to hear from you. Giving is a part of worship. If you don't already give virtually, now is a great time to do so. You can go to our website, and click on the Give button at the top of our landing page. Your giving is a matter between you and the Lord. However, we do want you to know that when you give to HGCF, that the money given is used directly and exclusively in supporting God's work. No member of the leadership of His Gospel receives a salary or a stipend from the church.